uh, you see a slightly more artistic uh, take on something uh, uh, slightly different. Uh, this was a more of a longer piece, uh, you know, uh, on that um, appeared in uh, one of the monthly or weekly magazines that talks about uh, the drug, drug trade in Colombia, okay, and how it is, um, how it is like a um, like a cottage industry. Right in a, in 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 slums, so there is no nothing like a like an organized uh, factory or something where this happens. And people, families are involved in making, purifying, packaging, delivering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So and there are people there who are, you know, who are watching you different levels of the mafia, which is controlling this whole trade, and they kind of give you protection and they kind of you know pay you and uh, collect as well. So you'll notice that you know this is a photoshopped uh, rendering of a photograph, right? They started with the photograph, they kind of worked, and then parts of it is they have hand drawn it, and parts of it they have left it as a photograph. So the base image is a photograph, and a lot of interesting cutaways to tell you what is happening inside uh, different parts of it. Okay. So for example, in this first uh, section, you will notice that there are people packing stuff into smaller packets, right? While life happens around them as if it is normal, right? You see a kid uh, flying a kite, uh, housewife going about her duties, cooking and stuff like that. Uh, people hanging around, some guy delivering, and there is a guy on the roof who's like kind of keeping a watch, right? Maybe he's one of those mafia guys, right? Who's on the lookout for any kind of law enforcement and things like that, right? And there is some kind of a boss who is probably chilling out in a resort or somewhere who is controlling the whole thing, I think. That was the idea, right? Again, it is in, um, I don't know in which language it is, in, in Latin or something. Uh, Spanish, yeah, Spanish. Spanish or Portuguese, I'm not sure. But then uh, I think the interesting th thing about it is that, you know, it kind of goes well with the story, right? It's the story of this shady business happening in a very shady place. And uh, the visualization of that is also very moody, right? If you, if you look at it, very atmospheric, right? Even the smoke and the place and the, and the grimy, the griminess of the place comes through very nice. Any other kind of representation that the artist might have chosen, say, for example, a very clean uh, plan or an or, or a, or a, you know, architectural sort of diagram would not have uh, created or evoked the same sense of realism to this visualization, right? I think the artist, uh, so the, 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 the designer here went for something that is informative at the same time that, that evokes the mood of the place, okay? And he knows that a photograph can do that very well, but then you, the photograph is also not very informative, right? Because it hides a lot of stuff, okay? So it's very photographic in its treatment, yet it is very informative about the inner workings of the place, okay? So it's a very interesting choice that the designer went for here, right? So if you ask me about the accuracy of the information, maybe it's not there, right? Maybe it's kind of, uh, you know, it's not precisely that place where that kind of an activity may be happening, right? But it communicates the overall sense of what kinds of activities happen in places like this. And it's not important whether the packaging happened in this part of the house or that part of the house. Right? That's not important, right? So here there is some liberty that is being taken in, with the accuracy of the information, but the overall feeling that the designer went or want in the, in the piece has come through very, very effectively, okay? So many people would not classify this as a data visualization, okay, or information visualization, but I would think that, you know, here is where, you know, as designers, we have to make choices such as these, right? Uh, if, if purely a data visualizer will think of it as not at all as a visualization and would not even consider this as a possibility at all, right? And therefore, they will be poorer for an outcome like this, right? But you, on the other hand, should be able to make such creative choices, right? And yet, uh, you know, come up with interesting works such as this, okay? And that's the point of showing this example. Okay, so this is um, uh, uh, just a very simple concept that is being explained, which is that uh, the transatlantic highway, okay, which is uh, how are the planes directed between the two coasts 
uh, across the Atlantic uh, Ocean. Okay? So if you look at uh, this is the map of Europe. Ireland you can see Shannon is the ATC okay? uh, that controls every single plane that leaves Europe towards America. And there is um, ATC at Gander in Newfoundland which is in Canada which controls all the planes that go from the east coast of uh, uh, continental America towards Europe. Okay? So all the planes that fly between these two continents are actually routed through these two uh, ATCs. So you can imagine how busy these ATCs are. Right? ATC is, you know what an ATC is, right? Uh, air traffic control. Okay? So these are stations that basically sequence the plane and tell them at what altitude they have to fly and which sequence they can go in, etc., etc. Right? So they are the people who control them. So these two stations are uh, at uh, two different airports, but the airports themselves are not very important, but the ATCs are extremely important. Okay? So they control thousands of flight that fly between these things. So wherever you take off from the US and wherever you take off from Europe, right, you have to pass through them. And they are like the single point of entry and exit for you. Okay? And how do they handle so many planes? Is, is, this is how they are handling it. Okay? So they have these corridors and they have these pockets uh, that they assign to each plane. Okay? So there are some minimum safety pockets that you need to follow. Right? There cannot be a plane within certain range, you know, both in terms of height as well as in terms of the width of the... So, so all that is explained here very nicely. Okay? Uh, and then this is, uh, this is how much a plane can take. Okay? On the left and right, it cannot be more than, it cannot be less than 60 miles. And forward and aft, it cannot be more than, uh, sorry, less than 80 miles. And there should be a 2,000 2, feet clearance above. That means 1,000 feet above and 1,000 feet below. So that's the envelope that each plane is assigned. And that is how they ensure that planes do not collide, you know, even though thousands are flying at the same time. Okay, you can go to any of this, um, <coughs> the flight radar, 20, flight radar 24, flight tracker. You guys used uh, any of those apps? Sky scanner. Sky scanner and so on. There are multiple open source uh, maps that are available. You just go there and then just look at the, this part of the map. You will see, tell, tell you currently how many planes are flying you know, over that uh, ocean. Okay, literally thousands of planes are there. You know, it's so crowded that space is. But they have a system by which you know, they control that and this is something that you know, would be of interest. So this is a, a graphic that was done for a travel magazine okay, called Condé Nesta Traveler. Have you heard of that? Condé Nesta, right? Condé Nesta is a travel magazine for the discerning travelers, right? So usually you will find this magazine in flights, in flights you will find it. Um, <coughs> and it contains uh, nice articles about, you know, exotic places that you can go and things like that, right? So a typical traveler uh, or a well-worn traveler would be interested in knowing something like this. So this is kind of in their area of interest. Now, they might have wondered, somebody might have wondered, right? How is that there are thousands of planes going between these two ATCs? You know, who is controlling them? How, how does it even work? Right? So this is meant for a general audience. Okay? Somebody who is curious to know about it and it appeared in a travel magazine and it was done by a very famous designer. Uh, his name is um, uh, John Grimwade. Okay? John Grimwade for the magazine. Okay? He's a very famous graphic designer. Okay? You can look up other works also. <coughs> by him. He's a British uh, designer. And uh, there is also these planes that go across, that cut across this one. If they're flying, flying from the north to the south. This is going from east to west, right? And they are routed like that. You, know, you can see that you know, they're going like But there are not many planes that do that. And there is also Concorde that flies above all of them, right? Because their altitude is much different from the rest. Of course, Concorde doesn't exist now. I think you guys are not at all familiar with Concorde, right? You don't know what it is. Yeah, 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 it's a supersonic plane. It was the coolest thing, but then it died long time ago. <coughs> that super highway, it's like that extends from like transatlantic. Yeah, this is the, this is, I mean, that is a name that 
they have given to this piece. And there is nothing like a transatlantic railway. That's the name of the article you can say, name of the piece, right? So, so they have this very detailed naming conventions such as this one, right? T U V X W and so on. So these are the codes that are assigned. Pilots know what to do when they are assigned such codes. Okay, and then you also have this product uh, expositions, right? These are called the exploded view of uh, things. Uh, you might have come across many of these things, right, in product manuals, uh, in you know trying to explain complex gadgets and so on. So you kind of deconstruct them, show them in multiple uh, uh, layers, and with a fairly reasonable amount of realism. Uh, so that you know you understand like for example a watch such as this um, like how many parts go into making this which part sits where and how does it work etc okay many such uh, examples for example these are this is a more technical component a uh, lot more detailed uh, new york times is very famous it, they do lots of these things so there is a dramatic element to this uh, this was uh, immediately after COVID when a uh, lot of businesses shut down uh, or was very badly affected and uh, people could uh, file, people would f file unemployment so that they can claim the benefits, right? So this is in the US. Uh, so this is historically what has been the trend of how many people file for un unemployment so that they can avail the uh, unemployment benefits. And uh, just this is during COVID. What happened in that March of 2020 or something, right? Or just a few months after that. I think they collect this data every month. And that particular month, it just shot up like that. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it looks very dramatic. And you can see the designers of the, mag of the newspaper you know, nicely use this six column format that uh, Times has to put that uh, last bar in the sixth column and then extend it all the way. So, you know, you can see it, uh, see it. I mean, any, any amount of headline would not have produced the same amount of effect, okay? The fact that you see historically, this is what you've been seeing. So the data is from 2000 onwards. Every year it has been like this. 2008 to 2010 was the economic recession, right? It is really bad. Even then, it went only up to this much. And this is what happened in 2020 in the first quarter, right? Around uh, April, May or so, right after COVID hit. And this is the number of... <coughs> and this is the following month, okay? Of course, Times did not do this, but some uh, visualization enthusiasts took the data and said that, if times were to do it the second time around, the second month also, what, would, what it would look like, you know? And then they plotted it and then it really went off the chart. Okay, so this is one of those early examples also. Um, Euclid's uh, elements of Euclid, right? Uh, Oliver Bryan did a very illustrative book on that. So, I mean, I would put uh, this kind of visualization, you know, in the... In even in the, this, um, this is more of instructional design if you think about it, right? So this is Euclid geometry is, uh, you know, the lots of textbooks are there. Brain uh, wrote a book which is entirely visual in nature, right? All the concepts explained visually like this, you know, through this. So very interesting approach. A lot of science concepts like this are all. So I would say that this is a, like, you know, kind of tangible visualization. Uh, so these are liquids filled and then you kind of turn it around and it will nicely fill up the larger square, right? Thus proving the Pythagoras theorem. Uh, more examples in the social realm. Uh, a city in um, Germany um, wanted to encourage uh, people to take public transportation, walk or even bicycle, right, to work rather than using uh, rather than driving themselves right so what they did is they, they kind of announced it and said that they're going to you know shoot a picture of people you know using these multiple types of transport we invited them over 
to the most prominent street in the city and then asked them to pose with their cars and took pictures of them and converted them into an interesting poster. Okay? So, this is 60 people if they were to use cars and that is how much space it would occupy. And this is 60 people taking a bus and this is 60 people if they took a bicycle. Okay? So, the difference is obvious right? and it made a lot more sense and people could identify with this message a lot better because, because what, why? Yeah, yeah, visually it shows a comparison, but what is a lot even more personal about this to people here? Empty streets, empty urban cities. You can relate to the past. Yeah. yeah, so it is their city, right? It is themselves and uh, it is their bus, right? And therefore, they can recognize this. It is themselves, right? They are, they are seeing, right? So, there is a lot more, uh, you know, connection there, right? If it was you know shown to you know if this was shown to india probably it will not may have the same effect right because this is like looks like a street that i don't recognize right so i won't relate to it and i know that you know 60 people don't ride cars like that in india right it's still a lot of people take the bus a lot of people walk a lot of people cycle so it might not have the same impact right the reason it worked is only because it was people themselves posing and then participating in this activity of so, there was a kind of an awareness and identification that was happening here. Right? So, this was the effort of a mayor of the city who organized the whole thing. He took these photographs and then he also made nice posters with these photographs and uh, displayed it all around the city. So, even people who did not participate in this uh, heard about it somehow and they were able to relate to it. So, these are you know, more um, you know very artistic side of it. You know, I would you know label these things uh, as data art rather than data visualization. Uh, Nadim Hydri is an artist who works with data and creates interesting sculptures and uh, art pieces out of this. So, he took the data of calories per capita in four different countries and then represented them as different sizes of the fork, right. So, clearly you can see that Bangladesh and Belarus are less, they eat less calories per capita compared to US and Barbados for example. So, imagine you know coming across a fork like this in a restaurant and then these are uneven tongs in a fork and then you know if it makes you think and reflect a bit and that is the purpose probably of this uh, artistic piece. Uh, these are street furniture uh, which serve a purpose at the eight, at the same time they also visualize some information in order to impact and change people's perception right so this is uh, a cycle stand uh, which is designed in the form of a car so uh, functionally it serves as a cycle stand but it also quantifies something right it makes an equivalence here so one car is equivalent to whatever number of bicycles are parked there right so, you know, instantly the message is uh, there, right? When people kind of relate to it, you know. It's clever, it makes people think, they wonder, they kind of pause to think about it, right? So, all of that uh, was the idea. Uh, this is a work of a photographer. Again, this is not meant to be done as a design visualization. So, he just created a uh, photo essay, okay? So, um, Time magazine commissioned this photographer, Peter Menzel to travel all around the world and photograph people with how much food or what kind of food they consume over a 15 day period for a fortnight or something. Okay, so, that is what he did. Okay, he took that as an assignment and then traveled to multiple countries. So, he asked families to post with one, two weeks of uh, provisions, rations that they use uh, and then shot them in their dining room, living room, in their basically wherever they live, right. Uh, so, this is uh, some country in South America, I am not very sure which, which is it. Um, and this is uh, uh, Bhutan. <coughs> so, you can see a you know, dramatic difference in the diet that people consume 
so this is a lot of protein, right? You know, and and the fact that they drink so much of carbonated uh, drinks, so much of packaged food, even the water is uh, something that they buy tells you something about the place, right? Uh, here, as you can see, water doesn't even feature here, right? A uh, lot of vegetables, grain is there, and that's about it. Hardly any meat you can see here. This is UK. Again, a lot of processed and packaged food. So mostly they go to a supermarket and buy it, right? It's not that like they go to a market or a farmer's market or something like that. No? So nothing is fresh, mostly everything is a uh, little bit of here, you know, the vegetable that little bit vegetable that you see is also this one of those long term vegetables, right? You can buy it and keep it for 15 days, nothing will happen to them. <coughs> uh, this is uh, Ethiopia. So, how little uh, y y they eat and what they eat also is extremely frugal, right? So, it's all hardy grains, that's probably what grows there. Um, you know, oil and little condiments there, you know, a bit of a lime, a bit of a chili uh, and so on and so forth, right? And even the storage tells you something, right? They don't even have proper containers, they store them in plastic bags. And of course, water is there, okay? And this water is not the packaged water that you see, right? This is the storage water, right? They go and fetch probably from a long distance. Um, this is India. A lot of alu and kan. <laughs> uh, it also tells you what is the family size. Uh, that's very interesting as well, right? So this is a family of four. This is a family of uh, six or so. The father is missing, okay? And these are probably kids, four kids. And there is a uh, maybe four, five kids, I think, mother and five kids, I think. Uh, this is a family of uh, yeah five again. And this is a large extended family, okay, joint family. You can see, like grandfather and grandmother, uh, maybe two brothers or you know, sister living and so on. Is there a connection with the quantity of family size? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's so basically he told them that you know how much do you eat in 15 days or how much food that you buy, okay? And buy it and then display it there, okay? So, uh, and this is not just, I'm just showing a few of them here and he did it for about 40 countries or so, okay? So, the link is where I have, uh, you know, the, where you can access the rest of the photographs. Look at it, okay? Now again, this was not meant as a visualization exercise or anything like that, right? It was just a, supposed to be a photo essay, okay? And he called them what the world eats, okay? But uh, I think there is a lot of very interesting data here, right? Uh, you know, it tells you so much about, I mean, even the table, presence of a table, right, in their living room and absence of a table tells you something, sizes of the family, the type of food they consume, okay? It tells you so much uh, about it. And uh, there is no hard quantitative data. Uh, the data is very qualitative, but yet it is extremely insightful. Okay, now if I were to present this, you know, entirely quantitatively, you know, you can find some UN report or something like that, which you know will have a table which will tell you calories uh, and so on and so forth, right? And that's a very dry data, right? It might not have the kind of insights that this one has. Okay, it might just tell, just they will reduce it to some number, which will tell you, like you know, how much calorie, uh, what type of uh, food they, how much proteins, how many, how much carbohydrates. Uh, how much of fiber, etc. Some breakdown, some detailed data is available, but uh, for some other kind of purposes that will be relevant data. But for a, for a more uh, qualitative story, you know, this is a uh, lot more interesting. I thought. 